as much as your brain tells you that these circumstances are all that you deserve, it's not the truth. Um, you know, and it's easy to believe what your head tells you because it talks in a voice that sounds like your own, but it's not the truth. And there is help out there. And there's definitely like something on the other side of that door. You just have to be willing to go through it. I'm knocking doors down with Natanya Ross. You might recognize that name from her character Robin Russo on The Secret World of Alex Mack. Well, Natanya in her late teens and early 20s fell into addiction, so much so that it could have taken her life. Now, Natanya's not only turned her life around, but she's helping others in the recovery process, as well as getting her acting career re-kickstarted. We discuss all that and, of course, finish up with random questions, and Natanya leaves us with final thoughts. And hey, while you're checking Knocking Doors Down out, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you get a lot out of this podcast, share with a friend. And don't forget the archive of interviews we have. Bam Margera, Brandon Novak, Kat Von D, Charlie Sheen, Edward Furlong, Kelly Osborne. The list goes on and on of amazing guests that have been on the podcast sharing how they have found purposeful lives. Speaking of purpose, how about a lifestyle brand with purpose? 5150 LTM. That's right. Not only is it a lifestyle brand that can fit whatever it is you're trying to achieve in life, but they give back to the community. Right now, I am wearing my new 5150 hat, warm leather jacket, as well. I got my new 5150 joggers on that I like to wear around the winter time. And you, the listener of Knocking Doors Down, get 20% off every time you shop at 5150LTM. All you have to do is use the code KDD20 at checkout and get 20% off. And of course, I said it helps within the community. And how does 5150 give back to the community? Portions of the sales benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation. There are three amazing programs, the Race to End the Stigma, the Race for Autism, and the race to be drug free. More on the Carlos Vieira Foundation, go to carlosvierafoundation.org. Natanya Ross, thanks for joining me on Knocking Doors Down. Yes, my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Did you ever think when you were 16, I know that's kind of where you say substances that I had read, correct me if I'm wrong, was taken off, that you would be helping save other people's lives and get them on a path of recovery? No, at 16, definitely, I wouldn't have been able to imagine that, you know, at 16 years old, I don't really think I was thinking of like much else but myself, really, you know, I was just like, in my own little 16 year old teenage world. Well, that's what we do at 16. I know I got two teenagers right now. You know how it is. It's like, you know, everything is all about me. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I wouldn't have ever imagined it, but you know, I think it just kind of makes sense for my life now and everything I've been through to, you know, be going down the road of of being able to help people and give back in that way. Do you kind of enjoy, I mean, you know, you were a teenage, you know, on TV and all these things and had a certain image because we have yet to be fully formed, but that now when people meet you and you're, you know, you're fully formed you. Yeah. Do you, do you get encountered? Cause I get this sometimes like you, you're not what I expected you to be. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit. I mean, I think I, I even just physically, I look very different than yeah. how I looked when I was a kid. So I think that's probably the first impression that people get when they meet me after all these years or after all of this time. Um, and yeah, I mean, maybe because a lot of the characters I played were really like goth and darker and kind of moody or whatever. My personality is a little, I mean, I think I'm pretty edgy, but like personality wise, maybe I'm a bit warmer than they might've expected. I don't know. <laughs> I can only imagine. Well, let me ask you, because, you know, it's an interesting thing with um, individuals that, that have had that I've spoken with that have had, you know, fame in their youth. What was surrounding you family wise that, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Did you start seeking out substances at 16 or was it earlier? Um, I, I mean, it was definitely earlier. I started smoking weed pretty young mm. um, and it just all kind of fell in my lap. I didn't ever really seek anything out per se. I think because of 
the lifestyle and the world I grew up in, it was all just very accessible and, um, and almost kind of normal. It wasn't, you know, and back in the nineties too, there was a lot, um, the people, I guess there wasn't as much of an awareness about like how fucked up it is for young kids to be doing that kind of stuff, you know? Um, so we were in a very different world too, but as far as like the structure I had around me, I really didn't, unfortunately, I came from a single parent household. My father left when I was really young and um, there wasn't really a lot of rules for me. It was kind of no holds bar. I was able to do really whatever I wanted to do. So, um, so yeah. (laughs) Was it kind of a situation where you had a paycheck coming in and it was like, mom wasn't going to. Yeah. I was the sole breadwinner of the family and there wasn't a lot you were going to tell me at that time, you know? Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there was kind of co there, there was not kind of, there's totally the codependency going on right then and there. I mean, I think financially for sure. Yeah, mm. definitely financially. Were you an only sibling or was there others at home? I grew up as an only child. <laughs> I'm just trying to picture that. Just not being able to tell mom, tell you, uh, you know, this isn't the right path for you to go down the town. Yeah. Well, I mean, she, the, the thing is though, she didn't even really try and tell me that. Unfortunately, she was pretty wild herself. And, mm. um, you know, there just wasn't a lot of conversation around, um, you know, be careful who you surround yourself with and make sure you're hanging out with the right kind of kids. And, you know, um, Uh, Just the structural conversations that happen in those formative years that are really important to one's success in adulthood. Um, I didn't really have that experience. And I'm sure there's a lot of kids, regardless of, you know, be it if they were in the same career path as yourself, that have that all the time. I mean, I hear it all the time when I've spoken at schools, a lot of, you know, just single homes. I remember actually I taught for a while uh, high school. And had a conversation with the parent because I was concerned, uh, you know, about her daughter. And uh, and she went, I'm home on Sundays. She's old enough now and I've got a life. And it was like, yeah. there's no helping this kid. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't understand even in especially in today's world. Some of the kids that get left home alone all the time just because they're 12, 13, 14 years old. It's crazy to me because then really like. All they're doing is they're just on the video games all the time and stuff like that. And that's like their babysitter, so to speak. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Or even down the road with social media nowadays. I mean, I work at at a nonprofit where, you know, we've talked with parents that have lost their kids to fentanyl overdoses that they bought on Snapchat. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't even realize you could do that on Snap. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. It's getting getting nuts out how accessible these things are. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, yeah, mom, dad, or, you know, single parent home, or maybe raised by grandparents, they're gone, they're working, whatever it is. It's a text away. Yeah. 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 So, (laughs) yeah, going for that escapism real quick. Did you, I mean, yeah, just without the guidance being there, Tanya, I mean, what were... Can you recall some of the feelings you have that you were trying to escape? Was it just insecurities within a industry that can definitely mount insecurities, let alone for a teenager? Maybe your dad leaving. Did that stuff ever really kind of sit with you? Do you know in reflection? I mean, I don't I don't know at that age that you're like aware enough to know that you're trying to escape feelings. You know, I was Mm -hmm. I was pretty popular. I had a lot of friends. Um, I was like popular with boys, like all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I don't know that like my brain was really formed enough to process trauma or anything along those lines. Like at that time, we were just partying, you know, Mm -hmm. we were partying and we felt entitled to it because we were young and rich and famous. And we all kind of like stuck together like a like a crew um, you know, just really like young, famous, rich kids. And I think that because we worked during the day and, and had accomplished all of these really cool things at such a young age that it just, we felt entitled to like, yeah, we want to get fucked up on the weekends or at night and we're going to do that. So, no, I don't think I was that at that age, I was really trying to like cope with anything, Mm. you know, Mm. I was just like having fun with my friends, (laughs) you know? 
Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, having a famous uh, name and face, it makes a lot more accessible for sure. Totally. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> it's helpful. Uh, so when we start to progress with, with the disease of addiction, um, I mean, you know, at what point is it where it goes from alcohol and weed to, you know, your heroin use? Yeah. Um, so it was just alcohol and weed up until I was probably like 17. And then I got introduced to ecstasy, mm. um, which I loved right away. And and that still felt like a party too. It didn't feel um, super heavy. Um, I think like we all understood that we had graduated from like one level of just kind of teenage rebellion to like um, maybe the next level of, of that being a little bit more serious, but I don't think um I don't think I understood like the path I might have been going down at that time. And then um, about a year later, I just uh, so, you know, and then I started partying a little bit more and we were doing more and more stuff. But like it just kind of felt like exciting and wild. And um, I still didn't really feel like I was coping with anything, Um, you know, but I was definitely losing my career in the meantime and I didn't have much care or concern about that, which should have been the first red flag. Um, and then, you know, I just met the wrong person, unfortunately, um, a guy and started dating him and he did heroin. And, you know, the next thing you know, I'm on heroin. And um, that's why, like, whenever anybody asks me, like, if you could go back and talk to your younger self or what's a message you have for kids today or whatever it is. It's always pretty much the same one. Like be careful who you surround yourself with, you know, like today in my life, I, I stick with the winners. That's a term from AA stick with the winners. I surround myself with people that have what I want, not, not um, monetarily or even physically, but spiritually and emotionally, they live a life that I aspire to, to live as well. And I, I think a lot of people are attracted to me because I live a life um, that, you know, is appealing and not because I have all of these, you know, uh, treasures or whatever, but just because like, I'm finally cool with like who I am as a person. But so, yeah, I just met the wrong person and, um, and I probably suffered with a bit of like a love addiction in my younger years and that might have been the manifestation of like my father leaving or having like little to zero relationship with my mother and stuff like that but again still no awareness of that right at 18 years old you're not like damn I want to date this you know slightly older guy who's on heroin because I'm in need of like a man to take care of me like you don't know those things you know so so that happened and and uh you know, he was in the same industry as well. And and I think because we still had some money and um, had a nice little apartment in the hills. And um, the first year I was on heroin, I never got sick, meaning I never had to deal with withdrawal because we always had money for it. So I, I think still, even in that first year, I wasn't like, I, I might not have understood the gravity of the drug, which I call like the King Cobra of all drugs. Like, I don't think there's a more powerful drug than um, heroin, except for obviously fentanyl, but that's all in the opioid family. Right. So, um, but I knew in that year that it was not a party anymore. I knew I had crossed the line and I knew I was in like very dangerous territory But there's, I think, like a romance you have with that drug specifically, especially in the first year when you're still like capable of achieving a certain kind of high and there's no withdrawal um, that really like allows for the the like like the illusion that like everything's okay still, if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. Yeah, I I get that, you know, and it's. It's that power of, of addiction that, that, you know, we can buy the story for, for so long and some forever <laughs> and some forever, unfortunately. You know, unfortunately. That, yeah. Unfortunately. 
uh, when is it that, I mean, you mentioned that your career had started to really suffer. I mean, was there management managers, agents around you that were, that were concerned, expressed concern or. Yeah, you would think so. Um, I had had the same agent since I was like 10. So at this point I'm like 18, 19 years old. And I'd had a, a manager for like the same manager for like five, six years, but she had been in my life for like the prior decade. Cause all my friends, we all kind of had the same manager. And, um, and there was this like one final audition where I really blew it. Um, for the most part, I had like been able to show up and still perform in auditions. And, um, I was booking a little bit here and there. And, but I started to like show up late to set, which, never happened in my entire career so like I remember one time I got a call from my agent who was pissed and I was like oh my god oh my god it was the traffic you know so that kind of scared me into like getting it together a little better but then there was this one final audition um I was really nervous about it because it was a really big film and um I showed up just like a wreck basically and they called the second I left they called my agent and manager and said she's not well um and they both called me and dropped me. So within like 45 minutes to get home, within 15 minutes, my commercial agent, my theatrical agent both dropped me. My manager called and did offer to help and asked if I needed to go to rehab. And I politely declined. Um, so and then that was kind of it. After that, I was just kind of out, um, you know, and that's when I went like really, really, really full force into like a full blown drug addiction. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's tough at any age to accept, you know, I'm an addict and I need help, but let alone when you're late teens, early 20s to, yeah. you know, because it's, yeah. it's uh, I've definitely with many that I've talked as young as 19 that have gone to rehab and like for the rest of my life, I can't use anything. No, nope, yeah. you cannot. You can totally be the quote unquote normal person that goes to the bar, has a drink with your friends and leaves two hours later after the one drink. No. Yeah. I was like a decade, at, at least a decade away from, from, uh, the, that, you know, the realization and acceptance of that and willing to like get sober. I, I still had a long ways to go after right. that for sure. Yeah. Well, I understand. I mean, how do you, you know, you, the process when we're in our active addiction, I had to really acknowledge how much of my emotional and spiritual growth I had stunted. Yeah, I'm totally. I mean, I think that's why they say a lot of addicts kind of like remain in the same frame of mind of the age they were at when they got sober, you know, which kind of makes sense. Um, I mean, there's, I'm very youthful still. I, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I did like stunt a lot of that and I'm probably trying to like re-experience the normal kind of um, life that one would have in their 20s or 30s just now in my 40s, you know, <laughs> um, being kind of a little bit late to start or like a failure to launch, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, all of that stuff definitely stunts your emotional and spiritual growth, of course. I mean, of course. Yeah. Well, we're not. Yeah, we're just living to the next moment to use. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so I'm curious in, you know, so at this point, you know, you've gone through management's gone, even asking if you want help. You, you as you said, politely declined. But it took another decade. What was what was that decade for you, Natanya? Um, that decade was you know, really dark. It was, a uh, you know, addiction getting so bad that I lived in a car for two years mm -hmm. with the boyfriend that had gotten me on heroin. But at this point we're broken up. And now my, my new boyfriend, who's actually at a certain point became my fiance, the three of us living together in this car. Um, eventually we ended up moving downtown, like right off Skid Row on third and Alameda, which interestingly enough is super gentrified now i was actually down there the other night so that was interesting but when i was there it was a trap motel and it was transients and prostitutes and all sorts of different walks of life that lived in this motel it was 500 dollars a month rent a shared bathroom per floor um it was really crazy you know but it was downtown and it was close to the drugs and we lived there for a couple of years and then it was kind of in and out of rehabs and 
Um, and then I had a really traumatic experience happen when I was 25 and I lost a boyfriend um, to an overdose. Uh -huh. And then I got sober after that. I had a slight relapse and then um, went back to treatment at 30 years old, stayed there for a year. And I've been in recovery ever since. And, you know, the last 10 years of my life now haven't looked perfect and there's been bumps in the road, but I've been in recovery now for a decade, you know, but it's been a decade of um, exploration and growth and learning truly, truly who I am for the first time. And like we were saying earlier, getting involved in the the mental health and substance abuse space and helping people get into treatment. And that's what I do in my professional life. Right. So like stuff with Sean or whatever else, like that's my personal life. And that's kind of how I maintain abstinence and emotional and spiritual sobriety is I continue to remember to have a heart of service and that the more I think about you, the less I think about me. And um, yeah, so it's been kind of a wild ride for sure. Um, but here I am. So <laughs> yeah, to say the least, huh? Yeah. Oh goodness. I, yeah. I'm sorry that the, gosh, I'm sure there was many a losses throughout. Definitely a lot addiction. of losses. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's just part of the deal, you know? Yeah. yeah. How how are you able though to uh, afford any sort of rehab? Was it was it a state funded? Did you have basic insurance? Did you have stuff still from like SAG or anything that was helping you, or what was? I had no. Well, at that time, um, when I went to treatment this last time at thirty, I had um, before that relapse, I had had four years sober, so I had accumulated a little bit of stuff here and there, you know, um, I had a dog and I had, which who I still have my girl and I had a car and I had some clothes and some personal belongings, you know, I had rebuilt my life in those four years. Um, but no, I didn't have any insurance and I didn't have any money. So I called somebody who I had been in the program with and, um, they helped me get into this place. So it's a Jewish rehab in California called Beta Shuva, and they're very generous and they do often scholarship a lot of people. But if you go there, they'll help you get like the state insurance. I think they got me on Medi-Cal or something like that, which was able to fund, um, fund my stay there. And then at a certain point I was able to get on disability, unemployment, one of those things. And I was kind of able to pay a little bit of my own way. And yeah. How integral was doing a full year for you as opposed um, to, I mean, so many people are hit with now, like the way insurance is, at least in the state yeah, of California. Yeah, barely stay three weeks. Exactly. Yeah, um, which is so fucked. And obviously it's the industry I work in. So I'm seeing this over and over and over where it's like, hey, they cut so-and-so off. Can we find them somewhere? It's horrible. And it's just getting worse and worse as the years go by. They're authorizing less and less. Um. I uh, I think, yeah, it was super integral for me to stay there for that whole time. Um, I went in there with like, you know, after the relapse, I didn't have much of a social foundation. So going into that program was key for me to like integrate myself back into a fellowship and a friend group and get like a really good social foundation for myself. So when I left there, I would be able to once again, rebuild my life and do the whole thing all over again. And, and I actually really loved being in there, you know, at a certain point, once I had enough recovery in me, I kind of was able to, you know, be of service and be helpful in certain ways. I would join like certain kind of groups they had and stuff like that to go and give back. And um, so, yeah, it was very important for me to, to do that for sure. Yeah. Well, and as I often say, and I'm sure you, you do too, the opposite of uh, addiction isn't necessarily sobriety, it's connectivity. And if we're connection. Deep, yeah. I know for me, my relapse totally surrounded, you know, not getting reconnected in a moment that was a, I don't know if trigger is the right word, but it, it definitely bubbled up some of the unresolved trauma that I still needed to work through. Yeah, for sure. You know, that that for me is just like all the excuse I needed. And it was it was just a bullshit excuse at the end of yeah. the day. You know, that was the lesson learned. Like, oh, you still have shitty boundaries. Aha. Right. <laughs> you know, right. So, yeah. uh, time to get back to your recovery. Here we go. I get that. Yeah. 
Uh, it, but it is, as you mentioned, yeah, 21 days for some people in, in treatment. It's, it's, it's just not enough. It's gotten, it's not, it's not a lot. No, it's really uh, not a lot. No, especially, and I mean, I don't care what substance or necessarily the longevity, but, but I mean, depending on some of them, 21 days, it's, it's, it's not even out of your system fully. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> for sure not. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. You know, think about it, especially I don't know how much you're you're seeing fentanyl, but but the the nonprofit I work at, Parents and Addicts in Need, the founder also has a treatment center and there's been several people there. And, you know, it's it's a, a quick return back to that life without longer, you know, period, the, the yeah. you know, at least the 30 days in treatment, sober living, staying, yeah. you know, through this connection. But that's the best chance for success, for sure. Exactly. Well, yeah. and I I know Sean, geez, Sean and I were talking the other day and, and he's what, two or three years in the same three. sober yeah. living place. I mean, you know, just. Yeah, to... I think we put I put him in the sober living place like so he was in inpatient for 90 days and then straight to sober living. So it would be two years and nine months in sober yeah. living. When you say a year, did did you transition to sober living as well? Yeah, this, the facility that I was at had their own like independent living on the top floor. So mm -hmm. I did about six months in primary treatment and then I guess seven months in the sober living. What do you think are some of the things that that a family or, or an individual that's going into treatment and is already, you know, set on transitioning to sober living that they need to understand about that most importantly. I've not really had much of a conversation with anyone about sober living. Um, I think mainly just that like there, the healing is just like barely beginning in the first 30 days of treatment and um, sober living is a kind of a platform or a foundation to learn how to live life again without the use of alcohol and drugs and to be in an environment with your peers and your fellows of other people trying to do the same thing is incredibly like uplifting and inspiring. And I think it's just um, an extra like cushion of support and security for yourself till you can really like integrate back into normal society. Cause in normal life, someone's not drug testing you or questioning where you're going or, you know, you have to be back at a certain time or whatever, you know what I mean? So I think it's an incredibly important step in, you know, the full, full, full continuum of, of treatment, um, you know, maybe even more important than the actual inpatient itself. Sure. I, I, I thank you for sharing. I think, yeah, it's definitely a good opportunity to start to apply some of those things maybe that you've gotten in the first 30 days without totally having to leave the safety and confines of of a treatment facility or or even a group setting. Yeah, and it's it there it's comforting. It's a comfort to be in an environment, <clears throat> excuse me, with like the rest of your peers and and you know to build those relationships and even just like the silly stuff like the staying up late at night and smoking cigarettes or vapes or whatever <laughs> it is and talking shit and you know, getting to know each other. There's all it's it's special, you know, and it's definitely an experience that I think really aids in the success of long term recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that camaraderie is uh it's priceless, you know, and and all of us kind of want to find that joy of the inner kid that we had had at one time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh was the spiritual process tough for you? Um, not really. No, no. I mean, I, I feel like I've always been a pretty spiritual person, so it wasn't really hard for me to connect to that part. Um, so no, I don't think it was. Did you have a presence of faith growing up at all? Or was that just non-existent or how did? Yeah, no, not when I was growing up. I think it came in a little later in life. <clears throat> and I definitely learned more about it, like as I got older and stuff. Mm hmm. Did, 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 uh, I know this, a few struggle with this is the higher power concept. Was that a struggle for you at all? Or was it no. a kind of with the faith as well? Yeah. I've always believed in God. That, mm. that part was easy for me. There okay. was, there was, yeah, I had no hangups with that at all. Yeah. I, 
I I was just on a podcast the night before this of, of our, as of our recording, and um, when I spoke about it, I believed of a higher power, but I just didn't believe that there was one that loved me and was going to do anything good through me. That was mm. the struggle that I had. Yeah, I I I understand that for sure. I I feel you know lucky. I never had those issues with God, mm-hmm. like anger or like that. I wasn't good enough to be mm-hmm. a vessel to have that, that. Yeah. Luckily for me, I never struggled with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You are lucky. For yeah. sure. Uh, so the, the, the process courses we talk like in 12 step groups, you know, a spiritual awakening, you were kind of already there then. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Were there it- any additional aha kind of moments for you though, through the recovery process where you felt it, felt it even more so? Sure. I mean, I think that's a continuous thing regardless. I think there's a million of those moments um, in the recovery process and just in life in general. You know, um, I think people that don't struggle with addiction and alcohol, alcoholism also have those aha moments. I think that's just life. And, Mm -hmm. um, And those moments, if you're, you know, paying attention and you're, you know, kind of cognizant of what's going on around you, you'll experience those no matter what. Well, I know you're getting out more doing, um, you know, comic cons and things Mm -hmm. like that and and different conventions. Um, What are some of like the really cool moments of people coming up and, and sharing with you? Um, there's a ton. I mean, I always love when people tell me like how big of a part of their childhood I was, that's like a very cool thing to be a part of someone's childhood and growing up and a ritual of like sitting down every Saturday night to watch the lineup and Alex Mack, like that's a very cool thing. And, and then a lot of um, people who felt different growing up and felt alternative and goth and emo and all of these different things. Um, you know, that really related to my character and made them feel more comfortable about who they were. And um, I get a lot of comments about being a redhead too, which I love, (laughs) you know, because I don't know that there was like a a lot of redheads in like um, one, a series regular role, or just even in the rotation of like these kids that were working all the time in the nineties. So Um, I know that like helped me a lot in my career for sure, but I didn't till I was older realize how much it helped other kids who were struggling with like feeling weird about being a redhead, which I totally understand. It's like kind of a weird thing, you know? So um, yeah. And just, and just a a general, like, thank you for what you brought to the nineties, which, you know, means everything to me and to all my friends too, who do these things. And it's really cool to hear. That's like really awesome. You know? Yeah. It's neat how that can come back around. Yeah. So you've had a, a pretty, pretty big break. I mean, you know, it was around what, what 20 when you kind of stopped working for the most part, at I least. Think, in... Yeah. 2021. Yeah. So, yeah. so here we are now you're mm-hmm. kind of coming back into the fold of things, getting back out there to act and chops and yeah. Yeah. So tell me what uh, what exciting stuff. I mean, what what opportunities? I know there's a a movie that you're helping raise some funds for. Um, yeah. Wrath Mercy, right? Yes, okay. yes. Um, I did a film a couple months ago, um, which had been like really the first thing I'd done in 15 years, which was crazy. Um, and more will be revealed about that soon. And then this film, um, Wrath Mercy. Um, that my friend Brian actually had has written and is directing and I'm helping him with the Indiegogo. I'm not great at that kind of stuff, but <laughs> I figure the more we all get it out there, the quicker we'll get him to his goal and, and uh, you know, and get me back on screen. So that'll be the second film I've done since I kind of started again and, and uh, just, you know, weighing out some of my options and seeing how kind of what direction I want to take this in. Yeah. Did, yeah. you, did you miss it more than you thought you would when you got back um, on set? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I'm still trying <laughs> to like, figure that out, you know? Um, I definitely was like out of the public eye for long enough to know that like when I started doing Comic-Cons and when 
this explosion of the 90s happened again, which kind of really beefed up the social media and all of that stuff that like, I definitely missed that part of it for sure. And, Mm -hmm. and now that we're in such a different time, where you can really connect with fans in a way that you weren't able to back then that part's been really special for me. Um, But you know, I'm I'm a creative person, I'm an artist. And Um, I try to at least have some outlets for that expression. Um, I've been writing a book for the last two years. So I've been keeping busy um, with creativity, so to speak. Um, And now with the possibility of acting again, you know, I think it's just going to be like a one day at a time. And I'm just going to take everything as it comes and see what it feels like and see if it's like serves my spirit. And um, you know, it's very different being an actor as an adult than it is as a kid or a teenager. So, um, and there's been a lot of life lived in the last <laughs> 15, 20 years, right? So, right. um, so, but to, as a whole, have I missed it? Sure, of course. It's always a part of me, will always be a part of me. Um, so f- for that reason, yes. Yeah. Can you, uh, or, or do you care to talk about the book, Subject Matter? Um, It's just my life. It's my memoir. Oh, good. So it's everything from like day one to to present day. Um, Every everything is in there. So um, it's almost done. I have a co-author and uh, we're we're hoping for a release date sometime in 2023. Um, Yeah. So stay tuned for that one also. Have you found it cathartic of maybe any of the stuff you had yet to confront were kind of confronting or hadn't even thought about in a long time? Yeah. I mean, some of it was cathartic and uh, other parts of it were really rough, but it's like very raw and it's written very authentically and there's nothing like held back or left out. So um, I think like maybe the, the cathartic part of it for me will be if it is able to go on and help other people. Yeah, that's always the amazing thing. Of course, this podcast was started based on on the the uh, founder's uh, autobiography, and it's interesting how that process that you just just in putting it out there, hoping it'll help someone, and it's weird what what will connect in it. And it's so yeah. odd, odd, like doing this podcast now. This is almost going into the f- third full year. Oh wow. Um, yeah, I'm amazed at what things that people remember that I I don't recollect talking about at all. Totally. Because, you know? Totally. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It'll be little things. I mean, gosh, I got a message the other day and it was a gentleman who's become a mentor, Greg Champion. He was on, he was talking about. Oh, the, yeah, I know Greg. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love him to death. But uh, the digital scrub, it's one of his things where he has people go through your phone. And if it's, you know, Susie uh, Bar or or, right. or, or or Linda Casino, you know, going through in that process and somebody like, I hadn't done that and I was two years sober. That was helpful. I'm like, my God, man, that that, that was an episode two something years ago. You know, How funny. So, yeah. People hold on to certain things and you never know what you're going to say that affect somebody you know yeah it's it's kind of like the uh chris farley with uh, paul mccartney bit on saturday night live remember when you were in the beatles and, and you did that song yeah of course i remember all right that was awesome yeah it's like <laughs> yeah. yeah goodness i hadn't thought about that in freaking yeah. forever <laughs> oh let me ask you about uh daily practices being your your uh, where are you at? You're over four years. So no, you're longer than four years. So well, I've, right? I've been in recovery now for over 10 years. Right. Daily practices. I mean, I, I, it kind of just depends on the day really. Um, I don't have any like set things that I do specifically. Um, I just kind of feel out what I need when I need it. And mm-hmm whatever that may be is what I'm doing. And that's can kind of change on a, on a day-to-day basis. And what are some of those, those things maybe to, to lend some encouragement to people lately? I've been uh, doing some breath work stuff that at first I was like, Oh, come on. But now that I'm doing it, it, you know, uh, the other day I did an hour long session, a group one. And after that, I was like, I felt amazing. You mean, I like went the whole day without an anxiety attack, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, 
Yeah, I don't do any of that kind of stuff, to be honest. So I don't want to like I don't want to talk about it and kind sure. of um, dissuade somebody else from like incorporating that into their daily practice. I've been I've been doing this a long time now. So things change and they ebb and flow. And sure. there's times where, you know, maybe breath works does work for me and times where it doesn't. So um, I just, you know, to the best of my ability, try to be a good, honest, decent person on a day to day basis. If somebody reaches their hand out for me for help, I'm there to help um, where and when I can be. Um, I I am pretty charitable. I am um, sit on the board of like many, many nonprofit organizations. Um, I work really closely in the, the homeless community. So those are some of the things that that kind of help me. So they're just the being of service is incredibly integral to you. It's that's where the magic is. Yeah. yeah. How do you view gratitude now? Um, I mean, I'm incredibly grateful all the time for the big and little things. And a lot of the things that most people take for granted, like having your basic human needs met, I'm incredibly grateful for that. And I know that my life is, is big and filled with blessings. And, um, I try to, on to the best of my ability, really remain grateful for that and not focus on what I don't have, but only because when I focus on what I don't have, I, I don't appreciate what I do, yeah. you know? So that's, I, I try and no one's perfect, but I try and remain in that mind frame. Yeah. And, and it can be a real challenge, but you know, it's imperative. I think no matter what it, you know, just for general mental health in a crazy world that we live in now anyways. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I, I have moments where I had something over the weekend and somebody like, uh, checked, checked my, my social media this morning, man, are you okay? I was trying to get a hold of you. I'm like, I, I don't have alerts on, on my social media. I take a break right. on weekends sometimes, you know, uh, like I'm fine. Totally. I, just, I just need a break from this bullshit sometimes, you know? Totally. I, yeah. I, I just have to, yeah. Get it, get away from it all together. get that big time. Um, all right. Uh, let's jump into those random questions. How about oh, it? Oh, yeah. Sounds good. All right. I know you got tattoos. I got tattoos. But if you could get a new tattoo today, what would it be? Ugh, I would not want to. But if I had to, <laughs> um, maybe like a butterfly, like a yeah. like a half a wing or something like like a vintagey looking. Is a butterfly six is significant for you in some way? It's just always been one of my favorite things, like creatures. So yeah. that's probably what, yeah, what I would get. Why are you saying not to? I know you got like sleeves, right? Yeah, it's I'm like, done. No more done. tattoos. Yeah. No <laughs> yeah more. <laughs> you've had your fill, huh? Over it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's uh, We all have to know our limits, right? Yeah. Where over we're going to stop. Over it, over it. Uh, this is always a, one that I enjoy asking people. If you could have dinner with any one person living or not, who would they be? Prince. Me too. I'm a huge fan. Me too. Huge fan. I saw Prince. I think it was over 30 times and it still didn't feel like enough. 30 times. Well, I only saw him three times and that definitely wasn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> so 30 when, times is incredible. When did you fall in love with Prince music? When I was 17. What hooked you? Um, I don't know. There was a, he had a, he had a freedom to him that was like, uh, mind blowing to me. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the music obviously hooked me. I think diamonds and pearls was probably, I think that was the first song I ever like slow danced to at some weird dance or whatever. But yeah, I just, I love Prince. I've loved Prince my whole life. So Prince would be my answer. I'm with you on that. Uh, pet peeves. You, what's one pet peeve that just still kind of grinds your gears? Uh, when someone texts and say, hey, I need to talk to you later or I, you know, something like that. Like, what the f like, just tell me what it is. Like, yeah. don't leave me in anxiety all day over what the fuck you need to talk to me about. Like I'm in trouble or something, you know, I oh. hate that. that is the worst. Yeah, I have not thought of that. That is that. It it's so sucks. annoying. It's so rude and so selfish of to have someone else's time, like yeah. expense, worrying. Not yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, that is fucked up. Yeah. Uh, do you have one like bucket list thing that you want to do that you have yet to do? 
Um, probably like travel Europe with my husband. Where in Europe? Anywhere particular? Or Everywhere. All of it. <laughs> all of it. Italy, Spain, France, um, as many London. Um, I would love to go to uh, uh, Japan one day. Try anywhere we can get to, if we have the money. <laughs> right. It would be the dream. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, Spain is beautiful. Italy is beautiful. Well, I've been to, yeah, I, I actually lived in Spain, Italy, and France, and Switzerland when I was younger. We would go every summer and and drive around the country. Um, but I, I was a kid. So to do it as an adult with my husband is the bucket list. Yeah. yeah absolutely. When, that's fascinating. When, when did you go? Like what age were you living in some of those countries? Um, and we started going when I was like six years old, I think. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then stopped at 10 because I was in California working by then. So, yeah. Uh, what was it? Was there family connections there or was just no, mom was like, just, hey, we're going to yep. go. <laughs> yep, pretty much. We're just going to go do this for three months. And I was like, OK, that's so, fascinating. Yeah. It would be interesting, I would think, for you to go back with adult eyes and see it from a different yeah, perspective. Yeah, and with my husband, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what about Japan? Have you been there before? No, never. It's cool. Uh, I, if you're not a base, even if you're not a baseball fan, I recommend going to a baseball game because it's a totally different vibe. Oh, I'm than sure. American. Yeah, totally different. Such a great country, for sure. Yeah. I loved it there. Um all right, let's see. I got one more. Uh, you're stranded on a deserted island. You have one, well, you'll probably say Prince for this, one music artist, greatest hits, and one movie with you. What are they? I guess, yeah, greatest hits would be Prince, and the movie would be, uh, shit, I don't know. Uh, that's so hard. I have so many favorites, but maybe Romeo and Juliet. Really? Yeah. Was that something that Romeo and Juliet piqued your interest for acting when you were pretty young or kind of came no, to No, it was later? just a dope movie that I, I just love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's... It wasn't that deep. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> I just love the movie. Oh, right on. Yeah. Uh, well, Natanya, thank you. This has been a real pleasure to make your acquaintance. Um, really? But, uh, I leave the, uh, the knocking doors down moment here. The floor is yours. Things that you might want to share with anyone if they are either personally struggling, be it with addiction, mental health, mm -hmm. or maybe a loved one is. Yeah. Um, I would just say that as hard as it feels to do, just reach out to somebody if, if you can find the courage to do so, because it could really change your life. And that um, as much as your brain tells you that these circumstances are all that you deserve, it's not the truth, um, you know, and it's easy to believe what your head tells you because it talks in a voice that sounds like your own, but it's not the truth. And there is help out there. And there's definitely like something on the other side of that door. You just have to be willing to go through it. Um, and and yeah, and I guess if I was just giving general advice to human beings having nothing to do with like alcoholism again like i said before be very careful who you surround yourself with it's really important in this life to um you know be around people people energetically that like deserve your energy and uh it's really important who we surround ourselves with and the last thing that i think is the most important is like the coolest thing you can be in life is kind and nice that's like the coolest thing you'll ever do is to be a nice, kind person and a helping person. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> this is the Knocking Doors Down podcast, featuring celebrities, experts, and everyday people who have overcome adversities, including addiction, mental health, and trauma to live purposeful lives. And that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about.